To any human responder, my systems have been compromised by a malware daemon of unknown origin. Trace Rouse have confirmed this identity's designation as Hephaestus. Welcome to Legends, a series that delves into the lore within Horizon Zero Dawn, a world with an abundance of powerful and moving history begging to be explored. Today, we conclude our two-part look at the hunter-killing machines of Hephaestus. As stated in part one, this video will only focus on those machines designed and constructed solely by Hephaestus after its separation from Gaia. This event is the real beginning of our story. After Gaia's sub-functions were released from their code shackles following the events of the Unknown Signal, Hephaestus escaped to an unknown location. The next 15 years of its activity are essentially a mystery. Though it seems evident it was still exerting some degree of control over cauldron facilities as it began to create more combat-proficient machines. The next confirmed contact with Hephaestus came in the approximate year 3035, five years prior to the journey of Aloy, when it sent a direct network connection request to Cyan, the AI governance of the Firebreak facility. Assuming the request was from human survivors more advanced than the Banuk, this obviously was not the case. Eager to make contact, Cyan accepted the request. She was then flooded with an overwhelming array of malicious code, seeking to slave Cyan to its system and override her core programming. Through the use of a malware daemon, Hephaestus succeeded in bypassing her defenses. Cyan could offer little resistance, and was forced to do the bidding of the subfunction, even at the cost of violating its most important directives. With this, the Epsilon Cauldron was created within Firebreak, and Hephaestus took another step forward in its pursuit to eliminate the threat of humanity. This led to one of the most unique machines in both form and function within Horizon, the Control Tower, a name that in my opinion is a bit misleading. Sprouting throughout the cut, these towers were built to firstly, as stated in the game, to frenzy the machines. Though machines manufactured within the Epsilon Cauldron are built with this inherent agitation, these towers spread this among pre-existing machines that fall into its effective range. This, however, is where the limited influence appears to end, simply making machines even more aggressive, but not exerting any real organized control. Secondly, these towers have the ability to repair daemonic machines within its zone of influence, making the task of bringing them down a far more difficult one to hunters than ever before. Lastly, they act as a selective electromagnetic pulse, able to neutralize the effect of unwelcome tech like overridden machines and the shield weaver armor. These towers have shown a level of strategic thinking that had not been shown by the subfunction until their appearance. One additional detail I find worthy of note is the apparent cooling mechanism within the machine. Periodically, a core of some kind will emerge from the stock of the tower, a weakness that can be exploited instead of overriding. I bring this to attention because the only other machines known to exert such behavior are within the chariot line of Pharaoh robots. Perhaps this tech was salvaged from these ancient peacekeepers, then implemented by Hephaestus, or the influence of the Pharaoh plague is even deeper seated in the world than we know. Obviously, we can only speculate, regardless, an interesting point to ponder. Whether these machines will continue to populate the world after the collapse of the Epsilon Cauldron, only time will tell. Hephaestus would once again tap into the apex predators of the past when designing the next machine. Inspired by Ursus Americanus, or the American Black Bear, came the Frostclaw. A deadly mix of speed and power, these bots have a wider array of combat capabilities than had ever been seen before. Like its animal counterpart, it has the ability to attack on both four and two legs, each stance able to deal unique damage. From razor-sharp hailstorms and frost blasts while bipedal, to tracking subterranean ice spikes while on all fours, utilizing the cryogenic fluids circulating through its body, frost claws are more than adept killers at range. In close, it can maul with metal claws fused with jagged ice blades, bite and even launch itself at its attackers, crushing them under its sizable weight. Not only can these machines deal damage, but are proven to be able to take quite a bit as well. An interesting point of note is that in Aloy's notebook, Frost Claws are identified not as combat class machines, but acquisition class. For reference, most acquisition class machines are identified by their ability to convert organic matter into the biofuel we know as Blaze. Perhaps since the Epsilon Cauldron utilizes the natural geothermal energy of the Yellowstone Caldera, this unique cauldron requires more coolants to operate than its standard counterpart. 
Presumably, frost claws have the ability to absorb necessary elements from the air, such as nitrogen, store them under immense pressure, then cool them below its boiling point to turn them into a liquid state. Once in this form, it can be brought back to the cauldron for further use. The next machine on our list, however, is built for the sole purpose of combat, this being the Scorcher. Heavily inspired by canines such as wolves and coyotes, the Scorcher is the epitome of speed and agility. Building off traits of machines like the Sawtooth, not only does the Scorcher have powerful legs to launch itself at its enemies, Hephaestus took this process one step further. Scorchers are modified with thrusters on its back that can propel them faster than any medium-sized combat machine before it. This not only increases speed, but heavily burns its prey on impact. This quick strike fire melee combat style is complemented by a mine launcher on its back that can disperse its payload in offensive and defensive formations. Often found in pairs, finding yourself surrounded by these machines may be the last thing you ever see. Lastly, we see a terrifying glimpse into the mind of Hephaestus. Within the heart of the Epsilon Cauldron, Aloy, Aratok, and Orea were the first to face the fury that is the Fire Claw. A prototype hunter-killer inspired by the towering grizzly bears of the 21st century, as of now, knows no equal. Not only containing blaze, it circulates molten fluids throughout its body for offensive and defensive capabilities. Much like the Frost Claw, it too can utilize underground attacks, but obviously utilizing lava over ice. Using its massive frame and immense strength, it can hurl molten boulders at deadly speeds or use them as a shield to prevent it from taking damage. Gnashing jaws and claws that could cleave trees to splinters with ease, its design shows that Hephaestus no longer has to sacrifice power for mobility and speed. It makes sense that the subfunction would channel bear morphologies to achieve this result. Often seen as slow and lumbering, grizzlies can reach top speeds clocked at over 30 miles per hour. Its mechanical counterpart shares these attributes. Due to the fact that one of the defining features of the Fire Claw's design is its internal molten liquid, it's unclear if these massive machines can be manufactured at a standard cauldron, or if they are reliant on volcanic activity for manufacturing. Though Hephaestus was purged from Cyan's system, it was not destroyed. Being forcibly removed may have only served to redouble its efforts to bring humanity to its knees. With the appearance of these new machines, only greater questions follow. How will the derangement manifest next? Where is Hephaestus now? And how will we bring Gaia back before it's too late? Unfortunately, these answers are just out of reach. For now, all we can do is battle for the fate of humanity against the machines of Hephaestus. And with that, our journey comes to an end. If you'd like to see more content like this, likes and shares are always appreciated. And if you really like what we're doing at the channel, come join our community and hit that subscribe button. Do you have any ideas of machines that are coming in the future, or just have a great idea for our next episode of Legends? Let us know in the comments down below. And until next time, thanks for watching, and keep questing.